Well, thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. Um, the only thing I noticed that you didn't mention one of the speakers, perhaps the main speaker, Sunny here, right? <laughs> Who are you, Sunny? You see, it's spectacular. It doesn't work. <laughs> uh, so it's supposedly a, a step, perhaps a little step towards artificial intelligence. So normally, one of the problems with uh, artificial intelligence is if it is possible in principle, because it seems that we have some features, some people argue, that humans, that machines don't have. And one of these, allegedly, is free will. So the argument goes this way, humans are free, at least in some occasions, for this reason they are morally responsible. But freedom can be no, cannot be implemented in a machine. So this is an a priori difference. Real artificial intelligence, at even with our intelligence, is impossible. Now, I won't argue about this specific argument today, but I will make it a little more problematic, the premise of this argument. The idea that we do have free will, at least as the tradition has taught us, we do have. Uh, so let's start briefly. Uh, let's assume that you are the members of a jury at a trial, and this is the end of the trial, and you have to, you know, you have had your discussion, you have to vote now to decide if the defendant has to go to jail or not. So you think, I so you thinks, and finally you vote uh, for, you know, guilt or not guilty, guilty or not guilty. Um, it seems that if we do have free will, this is one of these cases. My question to you guys is why? What's special in a situation like this that, you know, make it obvious to us that we are free when we vote. What, what, what's the point? Why would we think we are free in such a situation? That's for you. Or for him, of course. <laughs> Whoever wants to answer. Because I have to speak 35 minutes. You have 35 minutes to answer my question. <laughs> <laughs> so you mean that we are free in our decision to make? Yeah. If why we, why we think we... Not? Yeah, why we think we exercise freedom in that case? Because we have options in mind that we could... Uh, that yeah, we that's the first point. So it works that way, right? This is the past. The past is given. We cannot change the past. This is the present. And it seems to us that we have alternatives here, right? We can choose either guilty or not guilty. That's not enough for... So, for exercising free will. Another condition is important. What is it? Facts. Hmm? That facts, that we are able to, you know, like summarize facts. Yeah, but that's part of it. So the two options are connected with all we know. So choosing between options is exactly that, evaluating the facts. So what is the other factor that's important? I'll help you because the 35 minutes are passing quickly. <laughs> uh, so the other factor is that it's us who decide. It's up to us which decision of the two alternatives will become real. It's not someone who is forcing us for vote for one or the other. It's not even random. It's not that I flip the coin to decide what to vote. It's me, exactly for that reason, because I, I evaluate the fact and decide if I have to do A or B. So there are two conditions. There are alternative possibilities, and there is self-determination. Okay? This is the intuition we have. This is freedom for us, free will. And this is why, according to all philosophers, and 99% of philosophers, um, why we are morally responsible. Because we have this peculiar... We are morally responsible as long as we exercise free will. Okay? Otherwise, there is no moral responsibility. If you don't have choices, you are not morally responsible for what you do. Or if you don't control, because you know, there is a strange mechanism, that you are not in control of which options become real, you are not, again, you are not morally responsible. So freedom is a necessary condition of moral responsibility. Free will. So if you have moral responsibility, it means that you have free will. Okay? These are the facts. But... The question is, do we have free will? I'll give you a very quick uh, argument that has been used many times by many philosophers, 
Uh, nowadays, more and more nowadays think that free will does not exist. So the argument is this. This is the intuition, right? So the, the future is open. But now, you know from physics, macrophysics, Newtonian physics, or the theory of relativity, that the universe works this way, at least at the macro level. The future is as determined as the past. So where is our freedom? That's one argument. Some people appeal to quantum mechanics, but quantum mechanics only generates randomness, not freedom. So the problem is how to reconcile the physical, the structure of the physical universe with the intuition we have. Uh, I'll give you a couple of examples. But uh, generally speaking, the idea then is that everything we do is totally determined by the past. So where is freedom? According to this scenario, I repeat, Newton, but also Einstein, after the Big Bang, every event was determined by past events and the laws of nature. Every event. This means the first uh, uh, case in which, uh, you know, uh, hydrogen is formed uh, helium, or your choice at the trial. Same thing. Same kind of determination, but the physical laws and the past. Okay? That's the idea. Where is freedom? Well, uh, this is one idea. I think it's a little simplistic com to conclude from this point that there is no free will, and I will say why. But that won't be the end of the troubles. Um, why is not enough, even if we are determined we could be free? Well, there is a tradition in philosophy that includes philosophers like uh, Locke, Hume, or Leibniz that think that actually this is not a danger for free will, that even if the universe is this way. Uh, why? Well, they say there is something wrong in the idea that we should be absolutely able to do otherwise. Think about this. Let's assume that tonight we go to an Italian restaurant here, and the waiter asks uh, Mirko, uh, Mirko, what do you like uh, to, to eat? Pasta or pizza? Knowing it's Italian, right? What do you like? Pizza. Pizza, pizza right? This is determined. Mm -hmm. um, it's even possible in principle that the waiter could know in advance what you decide. There are studies of this kind in case I can present some evidence. Uh, so someone could conclude, OK, Mir the waiter knew that Mirko wanted pizza in advance. So where is his freedom? Lock, humor, Leibniz would say that this is a, a wrong statement, a wrong remark. Because the point is, what we want from freedom? We want to do what we want to do. And so Marco, Mirko wanted pizza and asked for pizza. What's wrong with that? What else do you want from freedom? Simply, Mirko was determined that his will was determined, but it was his will, not my will, not random. He was asking what he wanted. What else do we want from freedom? As the philosopher uh, Daniel Dennett said, said once, this is the old freedom worth wanting. You are free as long as you do what you want to do, even if you are determined in doing so. Okay, that's the argument. So, the first argument against free will is that we are determined according to physics, but it doesn't seem to work. Because there is this strong tradition called compatibilism. Uh, I said, uh, compatibilism means compatibility of determinism and free will. And this has been defended by, yes, Locke, Hume, and Leibniz, but also Dennett nowadays. Uh, there is no problem with free will. And it, there is even a way of, uh, you know, we have this intuition that you want to have alternatives, right? And the idea is this. We have hypothetical alternatives in the sense that the waiter asks Mirko, do you want pizza or pasta? If Mirko <coughs> wants pasta, ask for pasta. If he wants pizza, ask for pizza. This is hypothetical alternatives. Then, of course, he wants one thing and ask for that. But if he wanted the other, he could ask for the other. This is the idea. So it's called hypothetical interpretation or conditional interpretation of this requirement, alternative possibilities. OK, so the idea is that even if we are determined, we could still be free. And consequently, we could sometimes be uh, responsible for what we do. This is also required for justice, for punishment. 
We punish people when we think that deserves punishment. And this is only, can only happen if they act freely. So, in this way, we have a definition of freedom compatible with determinism that make it possible for us, in some cases, to act freely. Of course, nobody acts entirely freely. Nobody is free all the time. We do many things without freedom, but in some cases, we like to think that we are free. You like to think that you came, I don't know if there are exceptions, you, you know, someone was forced to come here, but probably <laughs> most people weren't. <laughs> okay. Most people weren't forced, so they think they can, came freely. That's okay. Even if they were determined, it was their own decision. That's the idea. So people could be happy with that. Generally, they have been. Uh, you know, that's people like humor, Leibniz, but then it present this as the last uh, word on free will. Uh, the point is that this is not the last word. There is some evidence that things could be different. And I show you a little video now that should raise some issues. Uh, this is a video uh, by this Norwegian, a Swedish a scientist, Johan. So this is a TED talk. And this is an experiment. It works that way. Um, I don't know what's. Okay. Uh, we're gonna ju just let me say something. So the experiment it will present is a little dark, but is this way. Uh, so the subjects are presented pairs of cards of people that of the same sex, vaguely the same age, and they have to pick one of the two pictures. So two guys or two women, and they have to pick one of the two. So the experimenter gives them the card they've chosen, and they look at the card and explain why have cho they have chosen that card. But then something happens, okay? But yeah, but please, if you. This male participant, he preferred the girl to the left. He ended up with the one to the right. And then he explained oh, his choice. Uh, Wrong. Yeah, a little be behind. You, you, yeah, you know. a little. Yeah, a little. Uh, so the idea is that, let's see here. Uh, now we will take it. So the point is this. So they have. Several times they look at these pictures, couple pictures, choose one and explain why they chose that. But at some point you'll see with a magic trick, the experimenter gives them the other card, the one they haven't chosen. And nobody, almost nobody realize, first, nobody realizes that they have been given the other card. That's already surprising. But what is the most? And that they explain the choice they have not made. Okay, let's try. So that's the idea. Or should be the idea if he works. Yeah, in effect. Um, if you're interested in self knowledge, as I am, the more interesting bit is okay, so what do they say when they explain these choices? Okay. So we've done a lot of analysis of the Berger reports in these experiments. Um, and this graph simply shows that if you compare what they say in a manipulated trial, and with a non-manipulated trial, that is when they explain... The so this is, they explain the card they chose, right? ...the outcome, we find that they are remarkably similar. So they are just as emotional, just as specific, and they are expressed with the same level of certainty. So the strong conclusion to draw from this, that if there are no differences between a real choice and a manipulated choice, perhaps we make things up all the time. Sorry. Let's see if you... But we also done studies where we try to match what they say with the Okay, sorry, the, the image is like then we find that's clearer images. if we look at this, sorry, I started to so here, late. This male participant, he preferred Okay. And then you see what happens when they change the the cards, right? There is no difference. People invent stories. Since I'm a photographer, I like the way it's lit the box. But that comes to truth. This one. You see the trick? Yeah. She doesn't realize and explains why she, we, she chose, chose it because she did not choose. Okay, the other. And she explains. Thank <laughs> you. 
Orlebot. Yeah, I like her smile and contour of the nose and face. So it's a little more interesting to me in her haircut. Yeah, it was the other way. <laughs> Unbelievable. That's fun. That's a snappy look better. I like the snappy look better. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's fun. Okay. What made you choose him? I don't know, he looks a little bit like the Hobbit. <laughs> okay, uh, okay, that's the idea. And at some point, there is a, this guy here. That, this guy here, there are two women. He chooses one without earrings, and then he's given the card or the one with earrings, and he says, Oh, I chose her because I like earrings. So the point is this these people, him and others, defend this idea. It's a paradigm called the choice blindness. The idea that we do not know why we make our own choices, and we invent, after the fact, an explanation that is valid for the others, but first of all, is valid for us. They did something else even, uh, even with political ideas. So they gave, distributed some questions about, you know, um, violence or uh, military service or spending money in education, and then people had to give their own answers. And put, then they pretended to put down the results, and they give them another form with other results. And people explain why they made that, those choices that they, they never made. So the idea here is that people are confused about why, not people, us, all of us, like him. Uh, we don't know exactly what, why we do things, why we choose according to this, this paradigm. And they think that are, there is a famous book, for example, called The Illusion of Conscious Will. The idea is that our mental states uh, beliefs, intentions, desires are causally inefficacious. They are invented post fact as causally efficacious, but they are not. So we explain what we do because we don't know why we do things. We invent explanations for the other side for us. Now, I think this is uh, too extreme. There are situations, I think it, there are many cases in which this is true. Much, many more than we like to think, but I don't think they, they have proven at all that this is all the cases. When we really deliberate about things, about things we really care about, I don't think we are opaque to ourselves. I don't think the mind is not transparent up to a point. And I think some of our mental states have some causal power, but many less than we like to think. So my first uh, point is, uh, we are much less free than we like to think, but probably we still have some freedom. At least some freedom, and consequently some moral responsibility. This could be a difference with, the, with Sunny or not. That's another issue. But this is my first point. The second point I want to address, I mean, uh, how much I have? OK, is another issue connected with science and the mind. And this is the idea that some people have this idea that we are tendentially egoistic and violent, you know? Think about the tradition in politics that, you know, everyone, so-called homo homini lupus, right? So we are tendentially very aggressive. We are envious of the others, we want the stuff of the others, and uh, we fight all the time if we are not they are under control of the laws. So this, the government has to really control what we do, because otherwise we would be violent to each other, because our nature is violent and aggressive. This is an old paradigm, very common in, in politics. And there is a correspondent paradigm in economics, the homo economicus paradigm, according to which each of us, as an economical agent, tries to maximize their own utility, only their own utility, OK? Uh, egoism, again, is the anthropological view of this paradigm. It's very influential even nowadays, even more nowadays than in the past. So the idea is that. We are, you know, perhaps we are kept under control in our own communities, but communi different communities are, you know, can only fight with each other because this is our own nature. All these things are being proven wrong, wrong empirically. Uh, I'll show you now a couple of um, videos that show that our own nature is different. It's not that we don't have some intrinsic, uh, innate, aggressive tendencies. We do, but we also have something very different. I'll show you two videos by two of the leading um, 
social anthropologists and social psychologists. This is the first one is uh, Michael Tomasello, who works in Berlin at the Max Planck. A few minutes of his on. This is about uh, innate altruistic behavior in children and uh, apes. Oh. Hmm. The child does not know the experimenter. Child doesn't have any advantage in helping. Are you an idiot or what? <laughs> <laughs> it helps, right? <laughs> and this is about cooperation, innate tendencies to cooperation. He understands that he has to, you know, cooperate with the other. Okay, there are others. Let me show something about an ape. like a mirror so the monkey is very interested in that the ape is very interested in that but keeps it anyway that's it it's very complicated cooperative behavior So very smart. Okay, that's the idea. There are variations. So the idea here is there is this um, both phylogenetically and ontogenetically, so both in a, the evolutionary story and in the personal stories of individuals, there are these two tendencies to cooperation and altruism. And they are developed um, as long as the person or the ape feel that they are in a safe situation okay so the environment and the person that they have in front has to be um, in a situation of you know not con th there is no conflict there but there is more in the animal world there is something more there is some sense of justice or fairness in our cousins the apes and then so a for theory is also for us I'll show you the last video brief video very famous by Franz Deval the most famous ethologist and then I will make the final comments. Look at this. This is about fairness, sense of fairness in the animal world. So a final experiment that I want to mention to 
to you is our fairness study. Uh, and so this, this, this became a very famous study, and there's now many more, because after we did this about 10 years ago, uh, it became uh, very well known. And we did that originally with capuchin monkeys, and uh, I'm going to show you the first experiment that we did. It has now been done with dogs, and with birds, and with chimpanzees. Uh, with Sarah Blossom, we started out with capuchin monkeys. So what we did is we put two capuchin monkeys side by side. Again, these animals, they live in a group. They know each other. We take them out of the group, put them in a test chamber. And there's a very simple task that they need to do. And if you give both of them cucumber for the task, the two monkeys side by side, they're perfectly willing to do this 25 times in a row. So cucumber, even though it's really only water in my opinion, but cucumber <laughs> is perfectly fine for them. Now, if you give the partner grapes, the, the food preferences of my capuchin monkeys correspond exactly with the prices in the supermarket. <laughs> and so if you give them grapes, it's a far better food, uh, then you create inequity between them. So that's the experiment we did. Recently, we videotaped it with new monkeys who had never done the task, thinking that maybe they would have a stronger reaction, and that turned out to be right. The one on the left is the monkey who gets cucumber. The one on the right is the one who gets grapes. The one who gets cucumber, note that the first piece of cucumber is perfectly fine. The first piece she eats. Uh, then she sees the other one getting grape, and you will see what happens. They pay so with the stone. Talk to us. That's the task. And we give her a piece of cucumber, and she eats it. The other one needs to give a rock to us. And that's what she does. And she gets a grape. And she eats it. The other one sees that. She gives a rock to us now, gets again cucumber. <laughs> she tests her rock now. <laughs> Test the rock because she, she thinks her rock doesn't work. And she gets cucumber again. Doesn't even try the, the cucumber. <laughs> <laughs> so this is basically the Wall Street protest that you see here. <laughs> okay, so some people say, okay, but they, you know, they see the furnace, but only because it's their own advantages. That's not true. There are other experiments in which one um, uh, monkey uh, receives foods, and if he gives back a, a red uh, coin, she only gets food, but if she gives the green coin, also the monkey next cage will get food. So if they haven't fought before, she will always give the green coin in order to feed also the, the other monkey, even if they don't, they don't know each other. So the idea is that fairness, cooperation, altruism are strongly rooted in our evolutionary story. But in order to flourish in our lives, depends on the environment and very much on education, the right kind of education. So you have even studies with um, twin brothers or sisters, siblings, that are separated. And so the one that is raised, raised in a very nice and rich and open-minded environment, and the other one in a very de deteriorated one. And one will be very altruistic and cooperative. The other one will be aggressive and neo-Nazi or something like that. So it really depends on education. So I think one of the great tragedies of our time that the governments tend to uh, cut money on education, and the results are, you know, under our eyes. Okay, I stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mario.